All right, thanks a lot. Uh, two things, actually three things. So one, I <clears throat> appreciate you getting the applause out of the way before I talk. Um, second, I've been on this planet for 60 years. I have never lost my voice until today. I got off the plane, hadn't talked all morning, got into the lift, I went to say where I wanted to go. <clears throat> I was like, what the? So bear with me, I'll try to get through it. Uh, the last thing is an apology. I've never met a slide I didn't like. I made them all, so it's like choose amongst your children. They're all great. So I have way too many slides. They're only gonna be up for a few seconds each. You don't need to see them. Uh, you don't need to see what's really on it. It's just like colors and pictures. And like on the left here, we're gonna talk about the ABCDs of the digital age, Web3 protocol stack. So on the left is a lot of words, right? I use a lot of words. So we're gonna talk about some of these words, blockchain, crypto, finance, transactions, digital. On the right-hand side is this transition from Web 2 to Web 3. We'll talk a lot about that, and you'll notice Filecoin is, is right up there on the top on the right. So first, plan conceived in moderation must fail when circumstances are set in extremes. Doesn't say might fail, doesn't say must do a little bit badly, it says must fail. So all the stuff you think you know about finance and tech, it was all created in a time of moderation. Now we're in circumstances set in extremes, it's all pretty useless. And we overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. How many people in January say, oh, I'm gonna work out, I'm gonna eat right, I'm gonna do all this stuff, and then your Peloton ends up as a very expensive clothes rack, right? That's just because we overestimate what's gonna happen. The secret to change is not to focus your energy on fighting the old, but on building the new. Right now we're in the then they fight you phase of digital age, uh, and it's real, and they're gonna fight really hard because they're being disrupted, but uh, the good news is if you're here, we already won, that's the cool part. When the winds of change blow, some people build walls, others build windmills, I like windmills. Reasonable person adapts to the world, the unreasonable one persists in trying to change or adapt the world themselves. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable person. Again, if you're here, you're an unreasonable person. And you know, Jeff, when George Bernard Shaw said that, and then I believe you have to be willing to be misunderstood if you're gonna innovate. Jeff knows a thing or two about innovation. If I asked the public what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. They did not want a faster horse, we'll get to that. I love this, the advancement of the arts from year to year taxes our credulity and seems to presage the arrival of a period when human improvement must end. If I could just talk like that from 1860s, I mean, I would sound, if I had a British accent and the 1840s, I would be unstoppable. But this is a guy in 1843 basically said, everything that's been invented has been invented. Just let that sink in for a second. Almost 200 years ago, he said, everything has been invented, it's already been done. There's nothing new. Don't be afraid to take big steps. You can't cross a chasm in two small jumps. This is the place to say that. Anyone remember Evil Knievel? No, because you're all young. But he tried to jump over Snake River Canyon in two small jumps. It doesn't work. You gotta do it in one. So, I'm on Twitter. It will never be called X as long as I'm alive. Twitter. Uh, the greatest wealth is created by being an early investor in innovation. Making that investment requires you to believe in something before the majority of people even understand it. You'll be mocked, ridiculed, and criticized for your own consensus actions. It's absolutely worth it. So eight, nine, year, nine years ago, I wrote to my clients. I'd been introduced to digital assets in 2013 by my friend Dan Moorhead. And I wrote to my clients that this was interesting. It was short, one paragraph, 43 page letter. I got hate, you're an idiot, we'll fire you, don't talk about this. I'm like Whatever, fine, all right. So price went from 500 bucks in Bitcoin down to 186. I'm like, all right, they were right. Eight weeks later, it was 1,000. I'm like, no, there's something here. Did more work, did more work, did more work. Got more hate. But you gotta get through it. You gotta get through the hate. Because you can judge the quality of an idea by the quality of its detractors. If people you don't care about don't like your idea, it's not a very good idea. If people you respect, like remember Jamie Dimon was at WEF this past year, and he had 10 minutes on CNBC, and he talked about Bitcoin. Everybody's like, oh God, he's just up there pissing on Bitcoin. Like, one of the most powerful people in the world, you don't have to like Jamie Dimon, but he's one of the most powerful people in the world, had 10 minutes of fame, could have talked about anything he wanted. He chose to talk about Bitcoin. That's pretty cool. So Andy Grove decide, defines inflection points as an event that changes the way we think and act. 
there are few skills as powerful as understanding when things change. The problem is you don't get to wait until you know. If you wait until you know, it's already in the price. That's why human beings suck, it's a technical term, at investing. Human beings do two things really, really well. We buy what we wish we would have bought, and we are spectacular at it. Everybody piled into crypto in November of 21. Literally at 69,000, they were piling in. And then it goes down 74%, goes on sale, and everybody runs out of the freaking store. Investing is the only business, the only one, when things go on sale, people run out of the store. You put wedding dresses on sale, women will kill each other to get in the store. Why do we run out of the store in investing? Because we're human. And then we compound it. We sell what we're about to need. Here's a crazy stat. Over the last 20 years, if you, bought and sold, if you just bought and held stocks, you made almost 9% compounded for 20 years. If you just bought and held bonds, you made almost 6%. You know what the average investor made over the last 20 years? 2.9. Because they're idiots. All you had to do is pick one or pick 50-50. But no, they bought stocks when they went up, sold them when they went down, they bought bonds when they went up. The long bond is down 50%. Long treasuries are down 50% in the last year. People were piling in when interest rates were close to zero, because we're human. So inflection points require a response to innovation. If you don't act, you die. If you're wrong, you die. But most companies actually don't die because they're wrong. They die because they don't commit. They fritter away their valuable resource while attempting to make a decision. The greatest danger is in standing still. I tweeted this out this weekend. Winners lose more than losers. Winners lose all the time because they're not afraid of losing. Right? They focus on the next play. They don't care if they miss the last shot. Michael Jordan missed 9,671 shots. He says he doesn't even remember taking them. The average player, the bad player, obsesses about losing. They're so paralyzed that they might make a mistake, they don't do anything. That's why companies die. So if you can be an early investor, if you can embrace innovation, if you can believe in things, these people said, we're gonna string copper wire across this nation and people are gonna talk to each other. People said, you're fucking out of your mind. You can't talk through copper wire. You can't send signals through copper wire. If you invested, you made 11,000%. That's a lot, okay? But people didn't. And I love the thing on the right. This is from 1907, okay? This is us today, staring at a screen, not at each other. He's reading race results and he's pissed off because he lost money. And she's reading an amorous message. She's scrolling Instagram. That's from over 100 years ago, predicting wireless inattention to each other and physical people. So as technology evolves, the incumbents always dismiss it. The telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. Who said that? The founder of the telegraph company, duh. Okay, the Americans might have need of a telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. Really? Really? We're not going to use a telephone because we're going to send a kid on a bike with a message. Wrong. Okay? Henry Ford's lawyer said, Hank, do not invest in cars. What they want is a faster horse. Hank didn't take that advice, and he built the largest car company in the world at the time, and he put out a business. The largest car company in 1903 was the American Electric Vehicle Corp. Elon did not invent electric cars. Please stop with the fanboy stuff with Elon. I mean, we had electric cars in 1903. There were no gas-powered cars. They were all electric. They got about 46 miles to a charge, which is pretty freaking good for 1903, okay? 
And Hank came along, and he had this design for this Model T, and it was going to run on grain alcohol. He was in the Midwest, and he was going to cook up some grain alcohol. And his friend, John D. Rockefeller, said, you know, Hank, I have this stuff. I make lamp oil, kerosene, from this black stuff that comes out of the ground. And I have this leftover, and I just I shove it out the back, and it goes down the river, and the river just keeps catching on fire. And it's bad for my image. So I'll give you that. We call it gasoline. And you can put it in your cars, because it'll burn. And that's why we run on gasoline for the last 100 plus years, right? And those guys made a lot of money owning each other's stock. Now, back in 1949, everyone knew. By the way, when everyone knows something, nobody knows nothing. Right? When everybody knows, okay, that's what Mark Twain says, not we know the guess is in trouble. I mean, so it's not what we don't know the guess is in trouble, it's what we know that just ain't so. So, calculator like the ENIAC, the first computer, okay, the ENIAC, uh, weighed eight, weighed, had 18,000 vacuum tubes and weighed 30 tons. Computers in the future may only have 1,000 vacuum tubes and weigh one and a half tons. Everybody hold up their phone. You are freaking strong. There should be a show here for you. You're, way, you're picking up one and a half tons. And by the way, that computer in your hand is more powerful than NASA's first computer. In your hand. I love this. Anyone think Charles Darwin's a smart guy? I mean, I'm a biology and chemistry guy. I think he's a pretty smart guy. One machine will suffice to solve all the problems for every country. So you need about 100 computers. There are more than 100 computers in the world today, it turns out. When things are called a fad, buy lots of it. If it rots your brain, buy even more. If your parents, old people like me, say it's bad for you, buy a lot. Right? Slide rule, it's as good as a calculator. Battery doesn't run out. I've traveled the length and breadth of this great country, talked with all the best people. I can assure you, the data processing is a fad that won't last the year. ADP, automated data processing, it's not even a good company. And it's done three times better than the S&P. It's not even a really good company. Data processing is kind of here to stay. You guys are here about data, right? Something I've been hearing people talk about data all day. Incumbents always misjudge innovation because they become incumbents, right? They were the disruptors. Like, Theoretically and technically, television may be feasible, but commercially and financially, it's an impossibility. Who said that? The father of radio. Of course he said that. Television won't be able to hold any market after it captures the first six months. People will get tired of staring at a plywood box. Really? Anyone watch television in the last 48 hours? Or stare at your screen like... I dare you, pull up your screen time. I dare you, right now, okay? So, I love this one. Digital Equipment Corp, computing titan. First, 70,000 of venture capital in 1957, turned into billions, amazing. Ken said there's no reason any individual should have a computer in their home. 20 years later, he's bought by a personal computer company. I love that part, love that part. Now, innovation and disruption are driven by long cycle forces. So we've been a republic for about 247 years. The first half, from the 1790s to the 1920s, it was about turning human muscle into mechanical power. Right? We found oil. One of the greatest inventions of all time. This idea that we're going to stop using oil is just so stupid. It makes me crazy. Because a barrel of oil, a single barrel of oil, contains 40 human years of labor. Turns out we didn't need slaves after that. That's actually what was the biggest trigger. And we came up all these ways to mechanize things. We replaced horses with automobiles. That was better, mechanized power. But now we're in the second half where we're turning brain power into artificial intelligence, cognition, okay? And we've been through five epics Right? From steel and railways to steel, I'm sorry, steam and railways to electricity, the age of oil, information and technology. We're about to enter this next epic, and you're all part of it. 
this is maybe the most important slide of the day. Um, there's this site that's been going on since the 1950s, and I lived it. My dad sold and installed mainframe computers. Mainframe was founded in 1954. 14 years later, there's a little uh, innovation, shall we say, down in Silicon Valley around this thing called the microchip. And suddenly, the center of the universe shifted from Boston to Palo Alto. 14 years later, where I grew up in Seattle, uh, there's a little innovation around this thing called the personal computer. Most of my friends don't, don't work anymore. They were smart enough to go to work for that little company called Microsoft. I wasn't that smart. I defend myself. I say, look at the picture of the original Microsoft 11. You wouldn't blame me. I should make fun of them. They're multi-billionaires, and I'm not. But it's a funny picture. I mean, we all looked bad in the 70s. They look really bad. Um, Bill Gates' glasses are like this big. I mean, it's crazy. But Steve Ballmer's mom famously told him, honey, why would you work for that company? No one would ever want a computer in their house. Quoting the deck guy, right? He has 18 billion reasons he was right, mom was wrong. 14 years later, why is it always 14 years? Why is the cycle always 14 years? Because young people create everything cool. Because they don't know what they don't know. They're not afraid to try. So young people, and it's about a half generation, 14 years, invent everything cool. So this guy, Mark Andreessen, 19 years old, invented this little thing called the browser, made the internet possible. So then, 14 years later, there's this thing around the mobile net. And back in 1996, 90, I was working at the uh, Mile Moderate Notre Dame, and we invested uh, a lot in innovation, and we invested in venture capital. And we invested with this firm that no one had ever heard of at the time called Sequoia. Now everybody knows Sequoia. Michael Moritz was a new partner. He'd never done a deal. His second deal was this company called Google. And I remember our board saying, that's just stupid. It's a number 21 search engine. What do we, you know, we got 20 search engines. What do we need another one for? They, they're not a search engine. You know what Google actually is? You know what they do? It's amazing. You know, there's 1.7 billion web pages in the world. There was one in 1991, okay? Ken, Tim Berners-Lee wrote the first web page. It's 1.7 billion. Google owns half of them. Every time you ask a question, they've already got all the answers for that question on a web page. And it just directs you to that web page. That's what indexation is. And if, you've, if it's a new question, if it's actually a novel question, they'll create a new website. So they reinvented something that wasn't search. It was a better way to do business. Then the mobile net came along in 2010. I remember being back in Seattle at Craig McCaw's house. His family office had a meeting. And um, I remember asking him, do you think the mobile net is going to be big as the internet? It's like, Mark, are you kidding me? Ask me if they want a computer, like whatever. Ask me if they want a phone. They already got two. I got two phones right over there. So yeah, it'll be bigger. Mobile net, bigger. So now we're on the verge of the sixth epic, the blockchain era. And blockchain, it's, it's so big that it's even hard for me to get overly, I'm a hyperbolic personality. I'm pretty enthusiastic. I can't get excited enough for you about how big this is. And it's because of math, which we'll get to in a second. So everything happens faster. You can see on, you know, the blue line on, left, on this uh, right-hand chart, indoor plumbing is almost 100% after 120 years. North Carolina still has a few places where we don't have it. Um, everything happens faster. Look at podcasting and Amazon Prime. It's just straight vertical. Everything happens faster. Because math, now look, this is a, Incredible chart crime, right? Any long-term graph has to be on log scale. This is not, it's a, it's a, I shouldn't even show it. It's a horrible chart crime. But I like the acceleration of the growth because the acceleration is in the last 100 years, okay? It starts at 1,400 over there. In the last 100 years, right, we've gone from no cars to self-driven cars, driverless cars, from no movies to 3D movies, from no microprocessors to three-dimensional processors. So it's big. That's because of math. Right? When I was growing up in Seattle, I could listen to WGN radio. It's unbelievable. How the heck could I listen? Because they had a big old giant antenna. And this guy Sarnoff said, anyone who can hear that signal is a node. And therefore, it's a linear relationship. And networks grow linearly. Like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. We'll give you, give you a, a nod for that, Sarnoff's law. Then Metcalf came along and said, uh-uh. 
everyone who can hear that signal also has a connection. So an exponential growth. Now, the reason exponential growth matters is because, I said humans stink at investing, but you're also really bad at math. Two times two, four, good. 23 times 17. I'll wait. That's proven to be the limit of human, human uh, intelligence. You need a calculator to do that. And how about if I ask you a nonlinear regression? Probably not very good at that. So exponential growth is all about the power of compounding. And then Reed came along and said, no, it's even better than that. Because within the exponential growth of the network, there can be sub-networks that increase the connections. Like in this room, there's some people play golf, some people play tennis, some people play pickleball, and invented where I grew up in Seattle, and was dormant for 30 years, and now it's like everywhere, right? People are blowing out their Achilles and tearing their ACL to play the stupid game. Um, that's actually a fun game. So, but I have a fourth one, and, and I named, named it after a friend of mine. Um, I'm actually wearing socks kind of in their honor for on-chain monkeys. Uh, so I got my Rise socks on today. But uh, Sophia Vachetto, we were talking one day about this, and I said, no, there's a, there's a fourth dimension. Those pipes aren't the same width. Some are really fat, some are really skinny, some are really active, some are inactive. So there should be a fourth law, we'll call it Vachetto's law, that gets us to the, how fast networks can really scale. Now, why do networks matter? Because in the old days, if you wanted to be a big company, you had to control property, plant, and equipment. Today, you want to control networks. Networks are the most valuable thing in the world because costs grow linearly, profits grow exponentially, and exponential growth is the most powerful force in the universe. These are the five most valuable companies in the world, except they're not companies. They don't make stuff, right? What does Amazon make? Amazon makes nothing. They're a search engine that matches buyers and sellers, and they take a massive cut. A friend of mine bought a little company called Rock Laces. So if you're a runner, you know about this thing. It slides down your lace, so you don't have to, uh, if you do marathons and stuff. I mean, not triathlons, you don't have to tie your shoelaces. So I want to sell on Amazon. I'm like, fine. We get 45% of the revenues. He's like, baloney, no way. Tried doing it on his own. He sells on Amazon, pays them 45% of revenues. But his sales grew 10x. It's an amazing business, but it is not a company with property, plant, and equipment. Now, yes, they have some warehouses and stuff now, but Bottom line, they don't make stuff. They're a network. Same thing with Apple, right? They make little phones, but that's not where they make their money. They make their phone on the network effect because when there was just one phone, it wasn't very valuable. Now there's 10 billion connected phones. It's pretty valuable. So tech evolves slowly. Remember Pets.com? Anyone remember that company? It's the poster child for the stupidest idea of the internet. Chewy.com is the same damn business. It's worth $20 billion. It's the same company. It does the same thing. It just took time for the maturation or the evolution of the technology. We needed broadband. We needed GPS tracking. We needed you know, a phone in our hand. Like I've ordered a plane ticket sitting at a traffic light. I know I shouldn't do that, but I mean, I've actually done it. That's how easy e-commerce has become. You didn't be able to used to do that. You have to go to a travel agent and go to their physical place and sit and wait. It was horrible. Now, dog food comes to my house, cat food comes to my house, I don't have to worry about it. So, welcome to the digital age. Every company is being disrupted. The largest transportation company in the world owns no cars. The largest hospitality company, which is not the MGM, owns no properties. Airbnb owns, owns no properties. They're the largest hospitality company in the world. All digital, virtual. So if you're gonna invest in inflection points, it's gonna point you to digital assets. Exponential growth. I defy everyone in this room tonight to do this. Take a piece of paper. And I challenge you, especially you guys, because you all think you're buff, fold the piece of paper eight times. Okay? Can't do it. And everyone said, I could do it. Can't. Try. Go ahead. Try. If you could fold it 20, it's the size of this building. 
If you could fold at 30, it's the atmosphere. If you could fold at 50, it's the sun. If you could do it 100, it's the known universe. In the next 50 years, technological progress will increase one quadrillion x. That's a shit pot full of zeros. A quadrillion x. Just let that hang for a second. Usually I, I talk about a trillion. See, nobody shudders when I use the T word. I'm going to lock the doors and make you sit here with me for 31,710 years, which I promise you would be very unpleasant. Probably unpleasant already. And you have to spend a dollar a second. That's one trillion. I'm talking more than that. A quadrillion, 12 zeros. Okay, it's a lot. So, what are the ABCDs of the digital age? Artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, computing infrastructure, or chips, and big data. So, this is our core thesis at Morgan Creek Digital. We invest in these four areas, uh, and they are the four pillars of the digital age and the foundation of Web3. Web1, read. What Web1 did is it broke the monopoly of governments. For years, the church had a monopoly on people's lives. You couldn't read, you couldn't write, you went to church once a week and they told you what to think, how to think, when to think, what to do, who to pay your taxes to. You lived at their leisure, I mean at their, at their pleasure. You had no leisure, okay? Printing press busted that monopoly wide open. And the governments took over. So through state-owned and state-influenced media, okay, they feed the American companies the same way they control the Chinese ones, don't think it's different. So they controlled it until the internet. The internet made information bi-directional for the first time. In the old days, if I want to know about the Argentinian elections that are coming up in a couple weeks, I would have to wait for someone from New York to fly to BA, write a story, get back to her editor, and then he would have to edit it, and then three days later it would be on page 17, and I have to find it. Today, I can go on Twitter and look at a periscope, and I can see people chanting Melee's name and say, that dude's going to win. That's way better. That democratized access to information. Web 1 created $2 trillion of value. Because, actually, can I go backwards? Let's see if this works. Oh, I can go backwards. Look at that. Web 1 is the horizontal part of the line. Okay? Web 2 is the knee of the curve. And Web 3 is the, X, is the linear part. So Web 2 is read write. So now we could interact, but the problem with read write is the people in charge of it, the centralized authorities, are the ones that made all the money. Now, Web3, we, we the people, get to own, and it turns out Filecoin and other things are, are involved in that. So, AI, acting on data, okay? Now, AI, I love this. Standing on the shoulders of giants, Sir Isaac Newton said, I, you know, the people say, oh, you're so smart. I said, no, I'm not. I just stand on the shoulders of giants. So in the 1600s, you know, Pascal, pretty smart guy, um, kind of came up with this idea for thinking about how would, how would we calculate using a machine. But it wasn't until 200 years later when actually Charles Babbage came up with this first idea for a computer. Uh, it was mechanical. Uh, it wasn't until 1950 that Alan Turing kind of came up with this idea to test a machine intelligence. And in 1955, we coined the term AI. This is a 70-year overnight success story. Everybody's like, oh, AI is so awesome, it's brand new. 1980, now many of you weren't born, right? 1980 was the year of AI. That was 43 years ago, was the year of AI. Okay, it's not new. And yeah, we've been getting better. First we beat Kasparov at chess, and then we beat, you know, the... Uh, uh, Jeopardy champion, and, and then we beat the Go. Now, beating the guy in Go, that was a big deal. Go is the hardest game in the world, by, by far. It's, it's not close. So, this is 1989, okay, where popular science basically said that we were going to have a brain-style computer within the next two decades. Not so much. No. So, what is AI, right? 
what is it, deep learning? Is it natural language processing? Is it machine learning, neural networks, computer vision? Well, within machine learning, we got supervised and unsupervised. We got the stuff where you're stealing other people's stuff because it's copyrighted. You know, and well, are we really talking about deep learning, which is just using a small subset of data, or is it machine learning where you got a, a bigger source and the machine's actually learning instead of just studying? And then artificial intelligence. I actually met the, the father of our artificial intelligence, uh, this guy, Dr. I think Deaton is his name. And um, it's great. It was like four or five years ago. And he said, I'm so sick of this. 90. I'm back on. This, the claim to be AI aren't. They're totally artificial, but they're not intelligent. So most of what passes for AI has nothing to do with it. Now, at the end of the day, what we want and what we think and what we fear, right, Terminator fear, is the right-hand side, machine consciousness. Where the, where the AI, or there's even a movie about this now, where the AI is going to attack us. Now, they personified it so there's people like as AI. But what we're really worried about is some you know, machine having consciousness and saying, I don't need you anymore, so you're gone. We're so far from that. We're way over on the left in narrow intelligence, artificial narrow intelligence. We're not even close to AGI. People are saying, oh, we'll have AGI by 2025. Zero chance of that, okay? Being as smart as a human. Just think about your life. Think about this morning. Think about simple little decisions like what to wear, what to eat, who to talk to at this conference, what to talk about. There's so much randomness to it, zero chance you can program that into a machine. It's just not going to happen. And I forget the exact number, and this will be like, you know, 85% of statistics are made up on the spot, so this one will be two. But it's like 90,000 thoughts come into your brain every day. It's a lot. And you probably act on some very small number of those. And there's a randomness to that. There's just no way you can program. My eighth grade computer teacher said it best. He said, a computer, teacher, a computer is as smart as a screwdriver. It's true, right? It's only as smart as the people coding its instructions. And so, but, but the machine could learn how to code itself. Mm, kinda, maybe. We've seen some evidence of that, but I think we're a long way away. Now, the last 10 years, all kinds of progress. From 2013 to 2023, now we got this thing called generative AI. But, you know, everyone's made an avatar of themselves, right? I got one that makes me look just like the guy, the wisher. Is that his name? The big guy, the, you know, the, the, the my, my son told me who it was. I don't know who it is. But, I like them. I kind of like that one. I've got the beard and I've got the big muscles and I like that one. There's another one I like Harrison Ford. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Um, but I like him too. And look, ChatGPT, five days to go to a million users. It took Netflix three and a half years. Five days. But how many people have ChatGPT? Come on. How many people have touched it in the last month? Almost, I mean, more than I would have thought. I got it. I put in a couple prompts. It can spit back stupid stuff. Like I said something that I didn't know about, and it wrote, wrote all this stuff. I'm like, oh, that's really nice. That's cool. That's a... And then I asked it something I knew something about, and it was so wrong. It was so bad. It's like, I'm not going to use that anymore. So it'll get better, and I think there are certain applications it's probably good for, but it's a very narrow space, and it's really not this all sentient being, and it's language. You can't even use it for finance, right? You have to recode financial services to get it into an LLM model, and people are working on that, but we'll see. So, you know, Lenin said there are decades where nothing happens, and then there are weeks where decades happen. That's what happened, right? We had a week where everybody in the world said, I'm an AI. If you listen to earnings calls this season, oh my God, they had the AI count. Like the guy from NVIDIA, I literally think he said it 287 times. I mean, every word was AI, 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 artificial intelligence, right? Yeah, whatever. So, yes, in the short run, it sounds good. In the long run, um, we'll see. 
So how do we use it? Well, it's already all around us. Anyone ever used Amazon? It recommends stuff to you. It's pretty good at it. Or my favorite, um, Pandora. It's actually really good at figuring out music I like. That, that's AI. That's a really good application. Um, you know, machine vision, like reading. You know, we're in breast cancer awareness. I'm wearing you know, pink for Wear Pink Wednesdays. Um, for, actually, that's for brain tumor, not for breast cancer. But um, so, yeah, reading mammograms, machine. But do you trust the machine implicitly as much as you trust the human who's been doing it a long time? I don't know. We'll see, maybe. And look, there are all kinds of industries where AI is going to be a big deal. But at the end of the day, what it is, it's a tool for making decisions with data. And you're going to see everything I talk about in the last nine minutes is all about data. So blockchain technology is about capturing data. So this is really cool. Scott Stornetta, he's a venture partner of ours. I get to hang out with him. He coined the term. We actually did a podcast that you should listen to where he talks about this, and it was just so amazing. And, and it was just a simple thing. He said, look, if two people have a transaction, you need a third person to look over their shoulder. OK, that makes sense. He said, but that person could be corrupted. So you need a fourth person. But they can be corrupted. So you need a fifth person. So you need the whole damn world to look over every transaction. That's a blockchain. That's where it came from. It's amazing. So there's been some development since Satoshi came along and created this thing that we all know and love. Um, distributed ledgers, pretty simple, right? Been around a long time. Ledgers are pretty simple. In the old days, right, I used to lend people money and I would write down on my papyrus tablet, you know, they owed me money and they had to trust me. So the Medicis came along 800 years ago and they stole an idea for some monks. I actually learned this summer who those monks were. They were the Knights Templar from Portugal. It's amazing. True. They invented fractional reserve banking and all of the crap that we've had to deal with for the last 800 years is their fault, right? And pretty much the Illuminati is fault for everything. But the reality is that the trust industry, it's a $7 trillion a year industry invented by the Medicis because that green ledger book, so I lent her money and she comes back to pay me and I changed my entry. But we have the Medicis over here to validate. Well, I bought them off because they're corruptible. So I said, if I change this to 200, she owes me 100, I'll give you half. So she comes up to pay me the 100. I'm like, you owe me 200. And she's like, hey, Medici's. And they're like, sorry, you must have written down the number wrong. Now we don't need that because we have blockchain. So blockchain replaces trust with truth. It is the biggest thing that I'll see in my lifetime, for full stop, easy. And I hope to live, I'm middle age right now, I hope to have another 60. But I have to because I have a 12-year-old. So... Um, two older kids and, and a young one. Yes, same wife. Yeah, yeah. Um, miracle. People say, how did that happen? We're not sure. But um, they told us we weren't going to have any more. They lied. So blockchain technology will impact every business, every business in the world, from voting to healthcare. My mom almost died. This is, crazy. This is a true story. My mom almost died because a doctor in ER treated her without seeing her medical record because they're two separate systems and they wouldn't allow them to see the medical record. What the absolute fuck? That is malpractice squared. You can't treat a patient without seeing the medical record, but that's the world in which we live. Voting, <laughs> no more hanging chads, no more vote. Every person can punch a button on their phone, one person, one vote, not early and often like Chicago, and we'll know the minute the polls close who won or lost on a blockchain. That's easy. That, that's super easy. Travel, hospitality, education. We can actually educate kids instead of putting them on squares and making them memorize stuff. You know what our education system is about? It's about training factory workers. It was created 120 years ago. We don't need factory workers. We need knowledge workers. We need people with reasoning skills. I mean, we need to punt the entire education system and reboot. Blockchain can help. Big statement, blockchain will usher in a period of unprecedented wealth creation. More wealth will be created by blockchain technology than any technology in the history of mankind. Big statement. Decentralization of trust, value flowing without intermediaries. We, we liberate $7 trillion a year that's stolen from us by banks, insurance companies, brokers, auditors, accountants. No offense to the people, um, but it's stolen. Blockchain will completely revolutionize financial services the same way the internet, 
revolutionized media and commerce. All the values to be at ABC, NBC, CBS. Now it's all at Netflix because of the internet. All the values to be in mom and pop stores. Now it's at Amazon because of internet. Same thing happens. All the value from JP Morgan and all the global banks is going to blockchain. It's going to be the, the beating heart of the new financial system. Uh, do we really need banks? Anyone been in a bank ever? Like, really? Why would anyone go in a bank? You could do it all on your phone. No one gets a mortgage from, in the old days, you had a banker and you went to their office and they gave you coffee, and you got a toaster, and great. But that's not what we do now. We use our phone. And in fact, 40% of people in the world, 40% of adults in the world don't have a bank account. But they got cell phones. We can deliver financial services through their cell phone, through blockchain technology. Analog, electronic, digital. In the olden days, and I'm old, not this old, but in the olden days, you know, I used to meet Porter at the Buttonwood tree, right? And we would exchange paper for paper, stock certificates and money. The problem is on the way to the Buttonwood tree in New York, those guys with the tall top hats would beat us up and take our stuff. So it was not a very good system. So they moved it indoors and created the stock exchange. But even then it was still risky. So they took all the paper and they put it at this place in Dallas, Texas called DTCC. So there's still physical pieces of paper, idiotic, ridiculous, but we trade QCIPs, we trade electronic QCIPs. But that's costly and it's concentrated in the Western world. Why don't we digitize everything and trade it digitally with proof of ownership? Novel concept, $14 trillion a year, trades hands. We can do that all on blockchain. And this is the big number, 700 trillion. There's 700 trillion dollars. Every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every case of wine, every private business, every everything, everything that can be titled in the world will be a token on a blockchain. Not a little thing, a line item on a ledger. Secured, immutable, permanent. All of it's going. It's going to happen. It's so, this is as inevitable as automobiles, as inevitable as biotech, as inevitable as electricity. It's coming. You can't stop it. The economists predicted we had a world currency in 1988. In 1988, they read Tim May's communist, or, uh, <laughs> Crypto Anarchist Manifesto, and they said we'd have a world, a world currency called the Phoenix. It took 20 years for Satoshi to come along, and he created it. Why did it take 20 years? Because Tim May was an anarchist, and he lived up in the woods, and he had no friends. So it turns out you, if you're going to influence people, you've got to be around people. So it took a while, and now Scientific America says it's future money. So these guys, oh, they hate it. Jamie says it's a fraud. Warren Buffett says it's like rat poison squared. How do you know what rat poison tastes like, unless you're a rat, actually? Charlie Munger did one better. He said it's like tra trading newly harvested dead baby brains. WTF, Charlie. Really? Why do they say that? Because 46% of Berkshire Hathaway is financial services, and all of it's going away. So... Left-hand side is volatility of Bitcoin. It's volatile. Yeah, great. 5,000 years gold is money. One ounce by the fine person's suit. From Cleopatra's time to his suit of armor to a zoot suit to Savo wrote today. One ounce, perfect store value. 1971, 73, sorry. 73, we cut a deal with Saudi Arabia. Said, we'll protect you at all costs as long as you price oil in dollars so we can get off the gold standard. Went to fiat. Fiat will eventually go to zero. There have been 775 paper currencies in the history of the world. Three quarters of them no longer exist. All the others will go away too. And they will be replaced with crypto. So all that volatility you see on the left, it's in the blue line. But if you zoom out, we make higher highs and higher lows. This is an evolution of technology like every other evolution. And just like in 1973, you were not allowed to invest in international stocks as a pension fund until ERISA came. You couldn't invest in hedge funds or private equity or venture capital until they change the rules. Now it's about digital assets. Digital divide. 29% of millennials own Bitcoin. Boomers, 4%. Okay, this boomer bought a bunch. It's done okay. Um, <laughs> five years ago, this guy on television said it's an index for money laundering. Now they're gonna do an ETF. And he's telling people that you better put your money in, as long as it's ours, better put your money in to protect yourself against currency devaluation. Wow. This is going to happen. BlackRock will get approved. Everyone else won't. And I'm, I own the two companies ahead of them, but they both got pushed. So sucks for me. But 
BlackRock's going to get approved. Um, and just like Top Gun, there are no points for second place. So they'll get all the money because um, they're part of the cabal. Oh, I'm not allowed to use that word anymore. But um, $30 trillion of assets that can't invest in this today will be liberated. And uh, what if they put 1%? That's $300 billion. It's a big deal. All right, quickly, uh, Chip. Look, chips have been around uh, not that long, really since, I mean, the Abacus has been around a long time in Napier Bones, et cetera. But it's really the 1950s um, when microchips came along. And we've had you know, this transition from big, chonky machines in the 1940s to the little laptops and the little supercomputers we walk around with. Moore's Law says that every couple of years you get uh, faster and cheaper. Uh, I love this. Bill Gates, 1989. I believe OS2 is destined to be the most important operating system and possibly program of all time. He's always wrong. I mean, he's always wrong. We'll never make a 32-bit operating system. Really? I mean, so we went from one transistor, one, one transistor in 1950, to 8 billion transistors in 2010, and the newest chips have 156 billion transistors per chip. But it's starting to run into scaling problems because of physical limitations of physics. This is all about connectivity. In 1950s, there were no connected devices. Today, there's a lot. We have 30 microchips that we interact with every day. In 20 years, there'll be close to 1,000. You'll interact with 1,000 computer chips every day. Everything you do will be monitored. Every, your clothes will have monitors in them, everything. It can't work with client-server technology. It has to be blockchains. So we went from CPUs to GPUs to field programmable arrays to VPUs to TPUs, all this stuff. The bottom line, we're in an arms race. And the arms race is about chips. The faster the chips, the better the chips, the better the computing power and the more calculations. And it's all because of this linear growth, I mean, this exponential growth. And so we've basically gotten to the limits of centralized compute. Now we have to go to decentralized cloud, which creates a whole bunch of problems. We invest in a little company that's working on two of them. Uh, one is better chips for, for blockchain, and then the other is privacy protection units uh, for FHE. We like that. So big data, the new oil. So data has to be captured, analyzed, and acted upon. I love this quote. Too often we forget that genius depends on the data within reach. Even Archimedes would not have devised Einstein's inventions. The fact that we have all human knowledge at our fingertips means we are smarter. We can be more creative. Without analytics, though, companies are blind and deaf, wandering into the web like a deer on a freeway. It's a great visual. So big data, what exactly is it? Large, diverse, growing. It's everything. Everything in our life is now data. How much data? There were five exabytes of data created from the dawn of civilization until 2003. Okay? Today, there'll be close to 330 terabytes. Today. So five exabytes in a couple, you know, few millennia, uh, a lot. So big data, you got to focus on the 10 Vs. Analytics is really the key. Uh, and this, this is important for y'all. So if we think about the big data value chain, there's acquisition, analysis, curation, storage. Some of you all use the word storage in your world. And I love the, the funnel on the right. Analog storage, teeny tiny and shrinking. Physical analog storage. Digital storage knows no bounds. So things like compression and all the things related to storage are going to be very, very important. So the Emerging Web 3 protocol stack, the internet protocol started with 80. There were 80 internet protocols in the 60s and 70s. Today there are five that matter. TCP IP. HTTP, FTP, SMTP, and then www dot that ties it all together. Uh, the Fab Five. The blockchain tech stock is a little more complicated. Um, web3, it's about creating this thing called the semantic web. It's integrating the things I just talked about, AI, chips, and data. And it's about peer-to-peer -peer economies. And in the web, Web 1 and Web 2, 97% of the value is created or accrued to the application layer. Right? Tim Berners-Lee didn't get rich. Who got rich? Guy who gave away a free product and took all your data. That's how he won. So in Web 3, we inverse that. So now all the value is accruing to the protocol layer. And applications have an opportunity 
So whereas Coinbase took a meaningful piece uh, of the, the blockchain protocol layer, uh, I mean the blockchain uh, total stack, I think in the future, dApps have a really interesting opportunity. So the Web3 stack, you'll notice in the middle there, IPFS and Filecoin. Uh, I think they, these 80 odd protocols are likely to have the same uh, uh, outcome as the internet uh, and we'll end up with a smaller number. So stay, stay alive. Primitives, Filecoin included there as well. And I like the, the way they, they stack the IPFS uh, here using about using the data, defining the data and moving the data. And I'm not dumb enough to talk about Filecoin to a bunch of Filecoin people. So I, I, you've seen this before. Um, I do like the use cases for Filecoin. And I love this idea of being at the hub of this big spoke and being uh, applicable and becoming essentially the storage layer for Web3. Uh, project growth, it's exciting. Lots of things going on. Builders build or builders build. Uh, we like that. Um, just remember, as shit as it feels right now, in the depths of a bear market, we've been here before. This is the last bear market. These are the companies that emerged out of it and they went on to create lots of value. The best time to ever invest in your life is in the depths of the bear market. It's what all the talents available, 650,000 people just got laid off. 650,000 people got laid off by big tech. There's a lot of talent out there. There's a lot of money. It doesn't feel like it, but there's a lot of money to invest in projects. We're getting ready to close on our fourth fund. Um, and someone ought to tell these guys that blockchain's a fad because every company in the world is embracing this technology at rapid speed. So we do a couple podcasts, one called Around the World, one called Digital Currents. This is really good with the MetaGood founders and Ordinals, which I'm a pretty big fan of, uh, contact information. I too have a disclosure because for every engineer that we graduate in the United States, South Korea graduates 40, okay? I'm sorry, 17. For every engineer we graduate, they graduate 17. For every lawyer that they graduate, we graduate 40. They're a country of wealth creation. We're a country of wealth redistribution, and that's why. So thanks a lot. I've talked too long. Appreciate it.